jump right back with me? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me know when you can see the PowerPoint there. Everybody talk loud for me for just a second. Oh, my. Oh, oh. Good yeah. job. Okay. Uh, the doxology in Ephesians chapter 1, if you remember, begins at Ephesians 1, 3, where it says, Blessed be God, or praise be to God, or thanks be to God. And it ends in 3, 14, where it says, Unto the praise of His glory. Uh, that phrase occurs several times in there. But it's a, it's a praise to God for what specifically in those 14 verses? How would you describe it <coughs> using uh, the words of the text? Paul is praising God for what, Wayne Bogle? Jeremy, what about it? Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is a big praise to God for what? Glory of His grace. Well, well, that's not a very good summary. Summarize it for me, Jack Dodgen. Um, I'm looking for it. I'm not finding it. Everybody's asleep. It's all the wonderful blessings we have. Brother Jess, where? In Christ. That's exactly right. The key phrase in the whole passage is in Christ, in Him, in the Beloved, in whom. It's a praise to God for all the things we have in Christ. When you get down to verse 12, he says to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. And that refers to the Jewish Christians that have enjoyed the blessings of Christ. And then he switches in verse 13 to you, in him you also, notice the in him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, were sealed with, in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. We said that in early Christian writings, that word sealed there referred to what, Brother Dustin Rocha? Y'all are killing me, Tony. Yeah. Being Bap baptized? Baptism, that is correct. Baptism. All right, so um, the Gentile Christians also were sealed in Christ and came to be heirs of all these blessings of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 15 and following, Paul prays a prayer for the Ephesians. And basically what he's praying for is that they might come to realize some of the wonderful things that they have in Christ. And when he gets down to specifically mentioning those things, um, down in verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know three things. Number one, and you're going to have to remember these. He wanted them to understand what is the hope of his calling. That's, that's the thing that's waiting for Christians after this life is over. Uh, the hope of his calling. Number two, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints? What all do we have in Christ? What are all these blessings that we have in Christ? And number three, which comprises the end of the chapter, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? He wanted the Ephesian Christians to understand how much power God has toward Christians and how he uses his power for the benefit of Christians. And he said for, uh, to them that this is the same power that he used when he, rose, uh, when he raised Christ from the dead and uh, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. And then it talks about the exaltation of Christ and the power of Christ over all of these spiritual beings. Remember we talked in verse 21 about the rule and authority and power and dominion. Some versions say principalities and, and powers. 
and uh, dominion and lordship, something like that. What do these words refer to? Do you remember, Brother David? Uh, the well, I was thinking of how it relates to over there in Ephesians six with the principalities and the spiritual forces and stuff. All right, what does that what does that mean? What are principalities? What are we talking about there? The spiritual forces of evil. Right. Use another word. You're exactly right. What other words could we use to describe? Demons. Demons. Yeah. Demons. What else would fall into that category? Satan. Yes. Yes. But I'm not quite sure what word you're looking for. All right. Well, those are all good. Angels that sin, fallen angels, demons, Satan. All of those things would be in in uh, that category. So Christ is is um, far above all those things, and He uses His power over those things in the interests of the church. Now remember, we talked about in verse 22 and 23 that um, Christ is head over all things, including all these demonic powers. For the church. This verse does not teach that Christ is head of the church. It does teach that Christ is ruler over all these spiritual powers for the church, in the interests of the church. So he uses his power over all of these beings in the interest of the church, his people, those who are in Christ. And then he describes the church as his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ lives in the world and works in the world through his church. We are his instruments in the world, his body, his fullness in the world. We talked about the title of Rubel Shelley's book that he wrote a while back called The Second Incarnation. And he was talking about the fact that the church is the body of Christ in the world today. It is the incarnation, the enfleshment, if you will, of Christ in the, in the world. Christ is working through the, in the world through his church. And at least the title of that book is correct. That's exactly right. That's what this verse teaches. So, uh, uh, anyway, uh, this is basically chapter 1. If you broke chapter 1 down, and you always, uh, those of you that are new in studying the scriptures, you, you've got to learn to wrap your mind around larger portions of scripture and see how it's organized if you're going to see the flow of thought. You've got the doxology in 1, 3 through 14, which is a praise to God for all the wonderful blessings where, Nathan? In Christ. Thank you. And then in chapter 1, verse 15 and following, it is a prayer. It is a prayer that the Christians might come to know three basic things. What is the hope of his calling? What is the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? He wants them to come to appreciate those things. So when the, when the chapter closes, he's still talking about Christ's great power that he uses in the interests of his church. Okay? Now, to put that in perspective and to show how Christ has used his power in the interest of the church, his power over these demonic forces, over Satan. We start at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now see, he's talking about the power of demons, the power of Satan over the lives of people. Uh, you were dead. If you take the you back to verse 13 of chapter 1, it's contrasted with verse 12, we who had before hoped in Christ. And you have verse 13, you also, you know, when you heard the word of truth, so you would be talking primarily about these Gentile Christians, and of course it applies to all Christians as well, but contextually, talking about the Gentile Christians. If you go down to verse 11 of chapter 2, he says, Wherefore, remember that at one time you, who are Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by those who are called circumcised in the flesh, made with hands, that you were at that time separate from Christ, 
So if he's being consistent in the text here, you refers to these Gentile Christians in Ephesus, these Asians who were pagans formerly, and uh, now they've become Christians. So he says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Obviously, uh, he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death, the condition of being in sin that separates people from God. You were dead. And he comes back to this thought. If you go down to verse um, 5, see, he starts the thought in verse 1. He comes back to it in verse 5 where he says, even when you were dead in your trespasses. See? So he begins the thought in verse 1 and kind of uh, explores a little bit and comes back to the thought in verse 5. Now, if you'll notice in verse 5, it says he made you alive together with him. In some translations, uh, in Ephesians 2, 1, they pick the verb up out of verse 5 and they say, and you did he make alive when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But Paul doesn't actually use the words, you, he made you alive until uh, verse 5. So this translation, I take it this is the New American Standard, uh, doesn't pick the verb up, and it's a more literal translation. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uh, in which, in verse 2, refers to the trespasses and sins, see? In which you formerly walked. Now, I want you to look at um, a word here, and we're going to go over to Elmo, and it's a very important word in uh, Ephesians. It's the word walked or lived. Is this is this the new American standard that I had on the screen there? Yay or nay? Yay. Yeah. Yay, okay. We're gonna get down here in the in the book. There's two words here I want you to see very clearly if I can focus him in. First of all, there's this little word right here that I have a box around. Pote, P-O-T-E. That's how you spell it in English letters. P-O-T-E. Pote. Everybody say it with me. Pote. Pote means at one time, formerly, once upon a time, back then. And this word is used a number of times in this text. And it's, it's, it's the word that is in contrast to now. See, so you've got the back then. Formerly, once, that's this word right here, and then you've got now, see? And and the now is the present state of being Christians. Back then is before they became Christians, see? Uh, the word uh, walked is right here. Peripatesate, uh, from the verb peripateo. Peripateo, it's spelled P E R I. Well, never do get a pen that writes. P E R I E A T E O. Peripateo. Peripateo. That is the word that's used throughout Ephesians for walking or walking around. Some translations translate it lived. But literally, it means to walk. It's talking about a, a lifestyle, walking. There's all kinds of walking passages in the book of Ephesians. Uh, for example, just, just for grins, look at um, Ephesians 2.2 2 here, in which you once walked. Go down to Ephesians 4, verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. We have the verb again in Ephesians 4, verse 1. Where are we at? I'm at 14. I'm at the wrong page right there. I beseech you, therefore, uh, I, the prisoner of the Lord, to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called. You got that in 4.1. You're going to walk worthily of the calling. Then look down at uh, 4.17. 
It says, Did I say and testify in the court that he would walk as Gentiles walk? So in 4 1, he got walk worthily. In 4 17, no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. If you're not writing these down, you're going to be hurting later. Then in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 2, he says, Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. See it? Walk in love. Then in, was it, 5 8? Look therefore carefully how you walk. Be very careful how you walk. Is that 5 7 or 5 8? 5 8. 5 8. Then look down in, in 5, uh, what is it, 15 or 16? 5 15. Yeah. Or 5 8, he says, walk as children of light. Right? And then 5 five fifteen. be very careful how you walk. So the 515 is kind of the summary of all the walking passages. So you used to walk in trespasses and sins. 2-1, two, 2-2. Two, two, two. Uh, walk worthily of your calling. 4-1. Do not walk any longer like the Gentiles walked. 417. Walk in love. 5-2. Walk as children of the light. 5-8. Be very careful how you walk. 5-15. See? So this is a theme that runs through the book of Ephesians about the way we walk or the way we live, the way we pursue a lifestyle. Very important word in the book of Ephesians. It's not important because Dan said it's important. It's important because it is important because it occurs repeatedly in the text. And if you're doing exegetical study, look for things like this that keep popping up in the text. To uncover the emphases of the uh, uh, writer. It's like a little dot to dot thing. You connect the dots and you see the theme through the book. So there are the set of dots in the book of Ephesians. Alright, so uh, come back to chapter 2 now. Let's go back to chapter 2. We'll go back to our other screen for a minute, but it won't be for long. says you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which, that is, in the trespasses and sins, you once walked. So you formerly walked. Back then you did. So you lived in trespasses and sins. And then he uses a um, an adjectival phrase to describe how you formerly walked. Now see, walked is the verb. Now see if you can write this down. Walked is the verb. But according to shows how you walk, the manner in which you walked. Uh, there are phrases in Paul, like for example, over in Romans, at studying with Denny in Romans chapter eight, verse four, uh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See the phrase, according to the flesh? According to is an adverbial phrase. It describes how you're walking. According to the Spirit is an adverbial phrase. It describes how you're walking. See? The manner of your walking. So anytime you see according to in the Bible, you look for a verb that that phrase modifies. It tells you how that verb is being uh, carried out, how that action is being carried out. So you formerly walked according to, this. he describes this in three ways, the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now, this passage, I, I, don't, I do not understand uh, at all the way the translators translated this passage. Uh, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Let's go back to Elmo, and we're going to talk about a word. That word translated the course of this world, the course. Oh, 
Okay, let's go down to this box. See this little word right here? Iona, A-I-O-N-A. Or some some uh, transliterators would translate it A-E-O-N. A-E-O-N-A, Aeon. What do you what do you get taught in in uh, Greek one that that word means right there? Age. Yeah, you get taught that it means age, and sometimes it does. But uh, this word is a word that was used in ancient um, Christian literature to refer to spiritual beings, the the beings that populated the upstairs of the universe. Um, if if we were to draw this out uh, on a little chart for you. Uh, like this here, you've got the the uh, universe in two parts, and this is the physical part down here, and this is the spiritual part up here. Um, the beings that populated this uh, realm up here were often called A E O N S. If we were to put it in in uh, English letters, Aeona, Aeons, Aeons. The Gnostics taught that all these spirit beings, these were aeons. And uh, if you read the early church fathers, you often find this word referring to spiritual beings. Now let me ask you a question. In the context here in Ephesians, have we read about any spiritual beings in the context? Yes. Where, where did we read about it? Chapter 1, verse what? 21. And the point there, wasn't it, that Christ had been exalted far above all those spiritual beings and that he now uses his power over those spiritual beings in the interests of the church? See? Now, doesn't it make perfect sense in the context that back then, before you came to Christ, you were walking according to the direction of those evil powers, those evil spiritual beings? That makes pretty good sense in the context, doesn't it? And that's exactly what he's talking about. See, the, the word course um, is, a, is a dumb translation for that. It means the spiritual being, the spiritual power of this world. Um, he's talking about Satan, that's what he's talking about. And he's calling Satan an eon one of these spiritual beings in the spiritual realm. So the first word that he uses there to describe Satan is A-E-O-N, Eon, or Iona of this world. A similar passage, if you were going to do doctrinal study, would be over in uh, John uh, chapter 12, verse... Uh, 31, now is the judgment of this wor world, now is the prince of this world cast out. Talking about Satan being the prince of the earth, of this world. Or 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, where Paul calls Satan the God, little G-O-D, of this world. The God of this world. Uh, you could translate this word aeon as little G-O-D. God, like the gods. See, that would be the idea here. These spiritual beings that populate the upstairs of the universe. Uh, so, when we talk about the eon, the iona of this world, right there, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Satan. So, how were you walking? How were you living? According to Ephesians 2, verse 2. You were living according to, I would translate it, the God or the spiritual power of this world. In other words, the worldly spiritual power, the, the, the little G-O-D of darkness, Satan. You were walking according to Satan. See? And he goes on to explain uh, who this being is in the next little phrase. Uh, let's go in a little bit further so you can see a little bit more. Who's had Greek one that can pronounce this word for me right here that I got my pen on? No. You're close. 
Arkansas. Arkansas. Now, see, it's because it's uh, accusative that it's there. But Arkon, see, Arkansas, Arkon. We talked about this A R C H O N T A. Ark, Arkon, like the word archangel. See, it's kin folks. To this word we had up here in verse 21. If I can find it here. Um, right here. Our case. See, our case right here. And up in 21, it's, it's translated ruler or principality. Ruler or principality, our case. See, when you talk about the archangel, you're talking about the ruling angel, the prince of the angels. See? So the Old Test, the old uh, translations, like the Old American Standard and King James, translate this word principality. Principality. And they translate the one down in verse 2 here. Uh, this word here, they translate it the prince of the powers of the air. See, principality, prince. Prince means ruler, see? So who is this eon of the world? Well, he's the ruler of the powers of the air. Well, what do we mean, the powers of the air? Are we talking about eagles, buzzards, and stuff like that, or, and sparrows and woodpeckers? No, we're not talking about dragonflies or waspers or dirt daubers, are we? We're talking about the spirit powers, the spirit beings. Uh, that exists up there that we talked about in verse 21. See? So we were walking according to. See this little phrase, this little according to word, kata, right here? According to the eon of this world. Uh, according to uh, the prince of the powers of the air. And uh, then uh, it's, it's understood again according to the spirit that is now working. So he's called the eon of this world. He's called the prince or the, the ruler of the powers of the air. He's also called the spirit that is now working. Now look here right here. You've had this word many times, pneumatos, right here, spirit. But this spirit is not God. It's not a good spirit. It's an evil spirit. It's defined earlier in the verse as the eon of this world, the prince of the powers of the air, the spirit. So Satan is a spirit, right? And he's a spirit that is now working in who, does it say at the end of the verse? The children of disobedience. So the spirit that is now working in the children of disobedience is the same as the prince of the powers of the air, is the same as the eon of this world. See, that's this spirit being that is this powerful spiritual being that was directing our lives by showing us that we could live according to our own lusts. See? So that's how we were once living or walking when we were in our trespasses and sins. See? Now, when you get down to the end of verse 2... Let's go back to the other slide. I want you to remember the three ways that Satan is described there in um, verse 2. What word did we... See that where it says the course of this world? What word did we say that is, Brother Jess? Do you remember? Aeon. Uh huh. A E O N. And what is the meaning of that word in context? Little G O D. Yeah, it's a spiritual being of some sort. That's right. And uh, it's it's similar to what Paul says in Second Corinthians four four when he calls Satan the god of this world. Or in, in John 12, where he's called the prince of this world. But uh, it's talking about a spiritual power. I want you to remember that. Who is Satan, according to uh, chapter 2, verse 2? Now, if some of you just regurgitate the course of this world, I'm going to nail you on the test. 
because I didn't stop and explain it to you for you to just regurgitate something that's not right, okay? So, um, listen carefully. All right, so now he says the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The question is, what spirit is now working in us? See, are we still controlled and moved by the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience? Is that the manner in which we're walking? He says you formerly once walked that way. Um, the, the next verse... Um, <laughs> He says, among them, or among whom, and see that refers back to the children of disobedience at the end of verse 2. So among the children of disobedience, we too all formerly lived. Uh, that word formerly, again, or once, is the little word pote. Again, you've got it in verse 2, you know. You once lived according to the, the eon of this world. You've got it again in verse 3. You once lived among the children of disobedience. See? And once lived in the lusts of our flesh, he says, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So back then, once formerly, before you became Christians, you lived according to Satan's direction, and you lived among the children of disobedience, and you lived in the lust of the flesh. Now see, there's a sermon in there somewhere, I think. How did you used to live, according to Satan, among the children of disobedience, in the lust of the flesh? That describes the way people go about life. The word lust doesn't necessarily convey sexual desire. We use the word today in a sexual connotation. But epithumeo or epithumia in the original language just means want or desire. So you can lust for food, like these peanut butter crackers right here at a certain time of the day. I would lust for them. Uh, you can lust for money. You can lust for power and prestige. You can lust for nice clothes. You can lust for a new car, a new pair of shoes. You can lust for another man's wife, see? But you can lust for all kinds of different things. It just means want. <coughs> Over at uh, Galatians 5, verse uh, 16. Excuse me, Galatians 5, verse 17. Galatians 5, 17. He says, For the spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the spirit. These two are contrary to one another so that you may not do things that you want to do. So the spirit lusts just like the flesh lusts. What does that mean? It means the spirit wants certain things. That is, it wants good things. The flesh lusts for harmful things sometimes. And both of them want. See, God wants and the flesh wants. So what are we going to do? Are we going to do what our flesh wants or what God wants? See, that's the idea. So the word lust describes wants, desires. We lived in the lust of the flesh, following the desire of the flesh and of the mind. Notice he doesn't just say the desires of the flesh, but the desires of the mind. So we were doing, basically, what we want to do. Now, for some people, think about this. For some people, the question of every day is, uh, of their life is this question. What do I want to do? They say, well, what do you want to do? And they say, well, what do you want to do? Well, I'd like to. Well, what would you like to do? And so that's our question. What do you want to do? But if that is the question by which we live our lives, what do you want to do? Then we are, in fact, living in the lusts of our flesh. The question should be, rather, what does God want me to do? What does Christ want me to do? See, what do I want to do? It's the question of the world. It's the question of the people that formerly lived in the lust of their flesh. What does God want me to do? That is the question of a Christian. See? But how many days of our lives do we live with the former question instead of the latter? What do I want to do? 
instead of what does God want me to do? So is, is, is the second question becoming the greatest force in your life rather than the first question? But see, he's talking about the power that these spirit beings of evil had over our lives. What do these spirit beings cause us to do? They encourage us to live according to what we want to do and what we desire to do instead of what God wants us to do. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus put it very simply when he said, Not what I want, but what you want. So that's it in a nutshell, right there. And most people simply live doing what they want to do. Now some of the things we want to do are fairly harmless. You know, I want to go to the park and play ball. I want to go take a walk. I want to go watch TV. I want to go or whatever. And there may not be anything immoral or ungodly about the things that we want. But if all we do is what we want to do, chances are we will not accomplish what God wants us to do. See? And there will be times when we will be there to do stuff that... Uh, God doesn't want us to do. Uh, I can't help remembering the Robin Williams movie uh, and the line I thought was so funny. He was trying to uh, mock President Clinton, but uh, he, he's, he's standing up there behind the podium. It's about some politician. And he said, I did not sleep with that woman. I wanted to, but I didn't. You know. Well, when he says, I wanted to, that's exactly right. See, you want to do something. But you don't do what you want to do. You do what God wants you to do. See, that's the idea. That's the idea here. So in Ephesians 3.3, 3, talking about how we formerly lived, we formerly lived among the children of disobedience. And we lived in the desires of our flesh. We simply did what we wanted to do. And that describes the non-Christian lifestyle. But God. Powerful words right there. But God. See, you were dead. Verse 1. You were walking according to Satan's power. Verse 2. You were living among the children of disobedience. Verse 3. You were living in the lusts of your flesh. Doing what only you wanted to do. But God wasn't satisfied to leave there. God wasn't satisfied to leave you in the clutches of the wicked spiritual power. But God, see, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. See, that's where He picks up the thought of 2 1, where it says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. So He reaches back to 2 1 and says, Even when we were dead in our transgressions. And here he says God did three things. Here's the first one. He made us alive together with Christ. Now that is baptismal language right there. He made us alive together with Christ. He, he, he united us with the resurrection of Christ and the death of Christ. He, he made us live with Christ. We were dead. We were separated from sin. But he made us alive with Christ. These are all uh, fifth verbs. I want to show you this on the Elmo here real quickly. There's the little word soon. S-U-N with all these verbs. The little word soon means with. We'll go over and uh, look at this. Go over to um, verse 5. Here it is right here. See the little word soon on the front of this verb? Soon, with. You have it again on this verb. Soon. And you have it again on this verb. Soon. And these verbs are, He made us alive together with. He raised us up together with. And He made us to sit with. All three of those have a with on them. See? And it's with Christ. He made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up together with Christ. 
It made us to sit together with Christ. Now, we were talking in chapter 1 about how did God use His great power for us who believe? How did God use His great power over the demonic beings for us? In our interest. Well, here it is. Here's, here's at least part of it. He used that power to bring us out of spiritual death and make us alive together with Christ. The redemptive work of Christ had power. And when we're united with that redemptive work in the death, burial, and resurrection and baptism, God uses that power to make us alive together with Christ, to raise us up to new life together with Christ, to sit us with Him in the heavenly realms, to participate in His power. Okay. But we can't participate in His power until these things happen. Now, God was merciful in doing these things for us. See, He made us alive together. He raised us up together. He made us to sit together with Christ. Now, look back in chapter 1. Um, what it says in verse 20, talking about the great power of, of God, it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That's chapter 1, verse 20. God not only made him to sit at his right hand in heavenly realms, but when he raised us up with him, he made us to sit with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, we participate in the power of Christ over the demons. Uh, we have a part in his power, his rule, his, his control over the demons. You got a hand up, Mr. Rocha? Oh, no, stretching. Okay. All right, just didn't want to ignore you there. Um, what are the three things that God did for us when we were dead in sin, when we were living according to Satan and among the children of disobedience and living in our own lust? What did God do for us? He made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up together with Christ. And he made us to sit together with Christ in the heavenly realm. All right? So, this is the work of God in behalf of Christians. At least, perspective of Ephesians. But God. See, God didn't, wasn't happy to leave us there. He, he reached out to us through Christ. And when we accepted Christ, because of His great love, He did that for us. He did those three things for us. Then He says, by grace have you been saved. Which, of course, means because of God's mercy, not because you're good enough. He raised us up with Him, seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that, see, why did he, why did he make us alive and and raise us up with him and feed us with him? In order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now that he has united us with Christ and made us to participate in the power and work of Christ, he can show his grace to us who are in Christ. He can be forgiving and gracious and kind to us in Christ. Now, what other verse earlier in the, in the book talks about the grace of God, which is in Christ Jesus? The praise and the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. Chapter 1, verse 6. Yes, chapter 1, verse 6. That's exactly right. So if you're doing exegetical study, you can't help but connect chapter 1, verse 6 to this verse here. See, The grace toward us in Christ Jesus, the grace which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. Who are those that are in the Beloved? They are those who have been made alive together with Him and raised up with Him and made to sit with Him at His right hand in the heavenly realms. Again, in Paul, that is baptismal language. Say, how do you know that's baptismal language? 
Well, compare chapter, uh, compare Colossians 2, 12 and 13. Somebody flip over to Colossians 2, 12 and 13 and see if Paul uses a similar language over there. Colossians 2, 12 and 13. Jeremy, you wake now? Yes, sir. Read it for us. 12 through 14? 12 and 13. 13. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him to be faith, in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. All right. What phrases in that do you see also in the book of Ephesians? Uh, well, dead in your transgressions. Yes, that's in Ephesians 2.1 and in Ephesians 2.5. Okay, what else do you see similar there? Um... The idea of the uncircumcision. I think we saw that in. Yeah, but I'm talking about the in baptismal language. What else do you see there? Uh, I made you alive together with him. Yeah, just like you have in chapter 2, verse 6. What else? Anybody? Raised up with him. Yes, raised up with him, and he's using those with verbs, isn't he? Using those with verbs. Look over at Romans 6, 3, and 4. Those of you that are in the trailers, Romans, all of you are. Romans 6, 3, and 4. What does, yes, what does that one say? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Keep going. So that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. All right. Keep going a little bit. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. All right. Go down to verse 7 and 8. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. All right. Do you see any with verbs in all that? And you've got the same idea of, of buried with, raised with. So when Paul uses this language over in Ephesians, you're tempted to say, well, he uses that same language in baptismal settings in other verses, in other books. It may well be, and probably is, that he's talking about baptismal things here. But it's not just baptism. He's talking about participating in the redemptive work of Christ, his death and resurrection, which we do when we're buried with him, when we're raised with him, when we're made to sit with him. Uh, and that's how we are united with Christ, when we do these things with Christ. See? So, um, when we do these things, then God can show His grace toward us in Christ Jesus. Because it's in Christ Jesus where all these uh, blessings are and where all these blessings can be found. Alright? So, He says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it's, it's, it's through the kindness of God. It's through the, the grace of God. It's through trusting in the redemptive work of Christ. It's a gift from God. In the book of Romans, righteousness is a gift from God. Romans 5.17 uh, The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, Romans 6.23 is it? Wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's the gift of God. It's not as a result of works that no one should boast. What's Paul's point in the context of Ephesians? This is the power of God working in the behalf of those in Christ. It's God's power over these demonic forces that has done this for you. It's not your own power. It's not your own goodness. It's not your own ability. God has used his power, the same power he used in raising up Christ, in behalf of those who are dead in sin. What has he done with his power? Well, he's saved us. He's made us alive. He's raised us up with him. He's made us to sit with him. He's given us his grace. 
in Christ Jesus. This is the way that God has employed His power and it's a gracious gift. We didn't do it for ourselves. God did it for us. For we are His workmanship. In other words, once we're in Christ, we are the creatures of, of God. We've been remade. We've been reborn by God. We've been created in Christ Jesus. Notice that, in Christ Jesus. See, that's because, see, we were buried with Him. We were raised with Him. We were made alive together with Him. We were made to sit with Him. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, <clears throat> this is another walking passage we should add to the walking passages. See, if you compare this with 2 2, back then you walked in according to the eon of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air. You walked among the children of disobedience, you walked in your own lust. But in Christ, God has foreordained that those in Christ should walk in good works. Now this is sort of like chapter 1, verse 4, where he, he uh, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we, those in Christ, should be holy and blameless before him in love. So it's God's preordained plan that those in Christ should live a lifestyle of good things. Good works, good deeds. In contrast with the lifestyle that you once lived when you were among the children of disobedience. So if I were to write down passages in Ephesians, and you were to have to tell me about each passage and what it says about walking. Maybe you should be able to do that. I would be if I were you. Able to do that. And then you'll get a really good grade, maybe, on the test that you're going to have. But more than that, you know, really, honestly, truly, I could care absolutely less about any grade you ever make. You know what I care about? I care about you going out into wherever you're going to go and teaching people from the book of Ephesians how they're supposed to walk, how they're supposed to live. And doing it from these texts. Now, if I can help you learn that by giving you a test over it, then that's great. But I could care less about your grade. I could care less about your test. I'm trying to help make preachers of the gospel that can teach the Bible to people. Okay? And if you learn the themes of Scripture that you can show people, that's powerful. And teaching them in their life. So every, everything I give you on a test, I don't give it just to give a test. I give it because it's important. What I'm saying in the question is important in some way to your being able to teach the text, to teach the Scripture. All right, in verse 11, you've again got this word uh, formerly or once. Uh, it's a little word, uh, pote. So you've got it in verse 2, you've got it in verse 3, and you've got it again in verse 11. Uh, let me show you in, in the Greek text and so you'll see it. You'll at least see the recurring word there. Go back over here to verse 2. Where are we at? See, here's, here it is in verse 2, where he says, In which you once or formerly walked. Uh, verse 3, In which we all once lived. There it is again. See, you've got pote there, and you got pote there in verse 2. And then you've got it over here in verse 11. Remember that once, formerly. Uh, down in verse 13, you've got it again. You who once were far away, formerly were far away, pote, pote, all over the place in here. 
That's referring to the time back before you were Christian. Back before you were uh, made alive together with Christ, raised up together with Christ, and made to sit together with Christ. All right, so remember that formerly you... See, I, I might ask you, uh, tell me all the things that were true about you once from Ephesians 2, 1 through 13. He started, well, we once walked according to the eon of this world. We once lived among the children of disobedience. Uh, we were once called Gentiles in the flesh. We were once far away. See, that's marching right down through the text telling those things that were true once. See what I'm talking about there, Brother Jess? Mm -hmm. You do, don't you? Am I making it up, or is it, is it for, for sure in the text? It's there. It's there. See, that's, that's what I want you to be able to say. It's there. Nobody can argue with it if it's there. Yeah, that's, that's what you want to be able to preach, what's there. If it really is there and it's demonstrably there, you can just show it's there. Then that's that. I mean, that's it. That's as authoritative as you can get. So, uh, formerly, you Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by hands. See, there's our little word there. That's the first part of verse 11. Wherefore, remember that once you... Remember that you were at that time. Now see, at that time is a little different phrase. But the at that time is the same as once in the earlier verses. It's another way of saying the same thing. At that time. See, at that time is in contrast to now. We're talking about back before he made you alive together with him and raised you up with him and made you sit with him. At that time, back there, you were several things. Now see, if you can't get a sermon out of this verse, something wrong with you. You were separate from Christ. Now see, there's in Christ in Ephesians. There's that big doxology in chapter 1, verse 3 to 14 about all the blessings in Christ. There's the riches of His grace and kindness in Christ, you know, in, in uh, chapter one, uh, chapter two, verse seven. Uh, but at that time, you were separate from Christ. So separate from Christ is the opposite of in Christ. What does it say? You were separate from Christ, excluded or alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The word commonwealth could be translated citizenship. Um, it's a word from which we get the word politics. Uh, let me see what the word is here. Politeias. Politeias. P-O-L-I-T-E-I-A-S. 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 E-I-A-S. That's the word translated commonwealth. Uh, the word for city. Have you learned the word for city in uh, Greek word yet? Polis. Polis. P-O-L-I-S. See, this is a kinfolk word. Politeias. Uh, citizenship. It would be translated. Uh, a good translation. So you were separate from Christ. You were also excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. In other words, you didn't have any part in the, not only in the Mosaic covenant, but you didn't have any part in that promise to Abraham that we were talking about back there in the book of Galatians. See? You didn't have any hope, and you were without God in the world. Now, some people say, you know, we shouldn't bother the lost people out there with the gospel because if, if they don't ever know about the gospel, then God won't hold them responsible and they won't be lost. 
we can just let them die in their ignorance. No. Because at that time, before you came to Christ, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, strangers to the covenants, without any hope, and without God in the world. The only way you can have hope is through Christ and through the gospel. This verse is the best verse in the New Testament to describe what it means to be lost. Right here. It explores what it means to be lost in sin. Uh, you could say in 2.1, dead in your trespasses and sins. But what does that mean? Well, look at 2.12 and it'll explain what that means. It means you were separate from Christ. You were no citizens of Israel. You were strangers to all the promises. You had no hope and you did not have God in the world. If you don't have Christ, you don't have God. What does that mean about the Muslims? And what does that mean about the Buddhists? And what does that mean about the Shintos? And what does that mean about the uh, Hindus? And what does that mean about those all those people that don't have Christ? Well, this text says they don't have God. So, so... I mean, people will try to tell us that Allah and God are just different words for the same thing, but Allah has no son. And if Allah has no son, then that certainly can't be our God. So um, don't let them sell you that line. It's not true. But uh, lost is this verse. You were, you were those things at that time, once. So if you were going to really preach to people what it means to be lost, you'd take all those onces or formerlies or at that times in Ephesians 2 and you'd walk back through there and you'd talk about you know, what it means to be without Christ and how God used His great power to bring us into a wonderful situation in Christ. Let's have us a five-minute break and be back. <laughs> this was the day after. This was the day that we'd come on the rest from the year. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I do remember that. Well, he got on his skateboard and he was trying to jump up on him to the curb. <laughs>
It's made peach bombs that night. Have you heard this? Makes sense. It's time we make up bombs. Here's our bully mascot. Right? That kid's ready. No boring. We can't watch games. Hmm? So, Patrick, does the star in the NASCAR race even better or is it often the last lap? Well, if you wreck on the first lap, I guess. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That has been known to happen. I was looking at the car, but... I mean, that was, that's the fun part for me. It was like this guy getting in and he was in the wall with him. Oh, I think it's for scattered all over. Go on. A little more. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it's a little more than that. That's too. We all have to take care of it back to your car. And you're going to have to sit there. We're 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 going Does anybody have anything you'd like to ask at this point before we get moving further? Any question you'd like to raise? Yes, sir. Uh, Paul's prayer in chapter 1, is he specifically talking to the Jews or is that uh, general to both Jews and Gentiles? I think he's talking to all of them. He's, he's just praying that all of them would, would understand these things. That's a good question based on, you're talking about based on the difference between 1, 12, and 13. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the prayer is for everybody. Even, even in this passage, um, let's see here. It's a warns, isn't it? Yes, sir. Alex? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm, I'm getting everybody straight here. If you go back... He switches, he switches to we at verse 3. I, I was thinking the other way, that he was referring to those Gentiles before they had Christ at verse 1, since he switches to we in verse 3. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to point out, is that in this, in this text, he switches back to the we sometimes. And uh, I think when he does that, he's talking about every, all of Christians. Then he goes to us in verse 4, and that's where I thought he was talking about all Christians. Uh, I, that's verse 7. Yeah, verse 7 and verse 6 is, is where I'm looking at too here. You're making the same good point. He raised us up with him, seated us with him, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. So he does go back and forth some in here, and the us sometimes is inclusive. Now, how do you know when he's making a separation between the us and the we uh, to really stick? Well, when he specifies it like he does in 1.13 and 12, and in 1.11 and 12, see, he specifies who he's talking about. So at least in those cases, you know he's talking to two different groups of people. But yes, sometimes he, he, he goes back in and talks about all Christians. That's a good question and good reason for the question. Good study. Who else has a question you'd like to bring up? All right. Very good. So, after having talked about uh, how lost they were and what it means to be lost... And another reason, by the way, that uh, I think in verse 12, even though he is talking about what it means to be lost, and this would certainly apply to um, all people and what it means to be lost, I think he is particularly thinking about the Gentile Christians because notice the part where he said, you were at that time not only separated from Christ, which all people who aren't in Christ are, but you were excluded from citizenship in Israel. So he's, he's talking to people who not only were not Christians, they were not Israelites. They had no part in the promises. They had no hope and they didn't have God. But that situation is different now. See, Notice in verse 13, he says, But now in Christ Jesus... Now, if you, cir if you circle the little phrase, but now... What phrase in verse 12 does that contrast with? At that time? Yeah, at that time. And back in verse 11, what phrase is the same as at that time? Formerly. Yeah, formerly or once. And then if you go all the way back with the once or formerly, so he's obviously talking about before they became Christians. But he says, but now in Christ Jesus... See, and in Christ Jesus in verse 13 is the opposite of what phrase in verse 12? Separate from Christ. Yes, separate from Christ. So now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near. See, back then you were far off. Now you're near. How were you brought near? By the blood of Christ. Now, when you, when you look at that, you who formerly were far off, go down to verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to us that were near, for them that were near. So them that were far off and them that were near, he's obviously talking about the Jews and the Gentiles or the Gentiles and the Jews. And I'll show you that in this passage as well. But both Gentile and Jew were lost without Christ. See, everybody was separate from Christ, but not everybody was excluded from citizenship in Israel. So you're right to, to question those things, but he is he is dealing with two different groups of lost people. We can, we can kind of see that. They have commonalities in that they were all lost, but there are differences between the two as well. And verse 14, 
makes that quite clear because he says, uh, for he is our peace who made both groups. What two groups? Well, verse 11 tells you what two groups, doesn't it? He himself is our peace who made both groups into one. See, we are one group now. We're all in Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. But we used to be two groups. We used to be two people. Who made peace between Jew and Gentile? Christ did. He is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Um, the um, difference between Jew and Gentile was the law the barrier, the dividing wall. He calls this, he calls the law of Moses three different things in this text. He says Christ broke it down, but uh, he calls it the dividing wall, number one. Uh, I think the uh, some of the older translations translate it the middle wall of petition. Then he calls it the enmity in verse 15, the enmity, meaning that which made Jew and Gentile enemies, that which made them different from each other. So in verse 14, it's called the dividing wall. In verse 15, it's called the enmity. And then he just flat out calls it even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So he broke down or abolished the dividing wall, the enmity, the law. Who did it divide between? It divided between Jew and Gentiles. It treated them differently. It made the two groups. But Jesus destroyed that. He broke that down. He, he abolished that. So this is one of the great passages in the New Testament that talks about the abolition of the law of Moses. What's the purpose here? In making peace between Jew and Gentile, Christ broke down that which separated the two of them. He, he, he got rid of the thing that made them different. And remember, to whom was the law given? Only to the Israelites, right? It wasn't given to the rest of the world. It separated them out as a different people. But the law was broken down. It's called three things. Remember this. It's called the dividing wall, the enmity, and the law. Those three different things. He, he broke it down and abolished it. Why? Look at the that phrase in verse 15. So that in himself, and in himself is just like in Christ, see, he might make the two into one new man. Now, if you look at the two in verse 15, that's the same as both groups in verse 14. See? Why did he break down this dividing wall, this enmity, this law? So that he might create in himself of the two one new man, thus establishing peace. This one new man is a Christian. See? So Jew and Gentile have, have been brought together. They have been reconciled to each other in Christ. It's in Christ that they are one new man, a Christian. That's all they are, see? Thus establishing peace. Notice the peace at the end of verse 15 and the peace in verse 14 is the peace between Jew and Gentile. He himself is our peace who made both groups into one. How did Jesus make peace between Jew and Gentile? By destroying the dividing wall, the law, by by removing the law. Okay, so, number one, he made peace between Jew and Gentile. This is uh, verses 14 and 15. How did he do it? By breaking down or removing the wall, the law. But also, it says, that he might reconcile both of them. Now, the both still, see, if you go back to verse 14, both groups, that's talking about Jew and Gentile. It's the same as the two of them in verse 15. See? 
so he might reconcile both of them to God. Now notice the to God there in verse 16. See, in verse 14 and 15, he's talking about how they were reconciled to each other. In verse 16, he's talking about how both of them, both Jew and Gentile, were reconciled to God. So, not only were lost Jews and Gentiles separated from each other by the dividing wall, but they were separated from God by their sins. See, both of them were separated from God. Christ reconciled them to each other by breaking down the dividing wall. But through the cross, he reconciled them both to God. Now, here, here's the way you break this down. If you look at this verse, of course, both is referring to Jew and Gentiles. You could ask this question, to whom did... Um, Christ reconcile Jew and Gentile in verse 16. To whom did he reconcile? Anybody alive over there? To God. To God. Talk to me. Okay, so he's he's uh, he reconciled them to God. Now, by what means did he reconcile them to God according to verse 16? The cross. Through the cross, see, through the redemptive work of God through the cross. And then in what location did he reconcile them to God? In one body? In one body, and if you go back to chapter 1, verse 23, that one body is his church. So in the church, in the one body of Christ... Not only are Jews and Gentiles reconciled to each other and made one new man, but in Christ, in the church, in the body of Christ, they are reconciled to God. So everyone that is brought back together with God is brought back to God in one body or in the church. So it's absolutely part of God's plan. The church is not an afterthought. The church is part and parcel with the plan of salvation. Everybody that's brought to God is brought into the church. Can't be reconciled to God without being in one body in the church. And how, how is it that we're reconciled? It's through the cross. It's when we're united with the death and resurrection of Christ that uh, we are brought back together with God in the church. And then he says, and by it, having put to death the enmity. Now, he, he does talk of the law as the enmity in verse 15. But it seems to me that in verse 15, he's talking about the enmity between Jew and Gentile. And in verse 16, he's talking about the enmity between God and man. See? And it was sin that was the enmity between God and man. So verse 16 is about how, how lost humanity and God are reconciled. Verse 14 and 15 is how Jew and Gentile were reconciled. But who is it that made peace between Jew and Gentile and peace between man and God? Christ. See? And it was, it was that uh, work of Christ which accomplished all this peace. So then he, he summarizes about peace see, in verse 17. And he came and preached peace. To you who are far away, and peace to those that were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit of the Father. Now see, if you are going to do exegetical work there, see I've got peace underlined it in red. Go back to verse 14. He is our peace who made both one. Go to the end of verse 15. So that he might create in himself of the two point two man, so making what? Talk to me. Peace. Peace, correct. And he came to preach peace. Now, Christ preached peace between blank and blank and peace between blank and blank. Speak. Those who are far away and those who are near. Yes. 
But if you go back in the context, who are we talking about? Jews and Gentiles. Yes. Verse 14 and 15, it was peace between Jews and Gentiles. Verse 16, it was peace between who? God and man. Yes, God and man. Now, if you looked at that um, phrase, you who were far away, what verse would you go back to for the same phrase? 13. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near. But those who are near obviously are talking about the Jews here. Then he says, for through him we both can you find that word both up there earlier? 14. Verse 14. He is our peace who made both one. And then where else can you find both? 16. Verse 16. That he might reconcile both of them. And even though it doesn't say both in verse 15, what words are the same as both? Two. The two of them. That's right. That's right. So you see how you trace these phrases through and you get your dots that you connect through this passage. There's no neater explanation of Christianity in the entire Bible than Ephesians chapter 2. If there's one passage that I would have you memorize from the entire New Testament, it would be Ephesians chapter 2. Because Ephesians 2 kind of explains it all in a nutshell. You know, it's, it's a great passage for explaining the gospel, for preaching to people. He says, for through him, that is through Christ, in verse 18, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So how do, I, how, how do we have access to God? Through Christ. Um, which verse earlier talks about man's access to God and how he gained access to, to the Father, to God. Which, which verse earlier? It uses different words, but it talks about our access to God. Speak to me. The verse 213. That's pretty good. We've been brought near. Which one more specifically talks about our union to God or our reconciliation to God? 2 verse 6. Uh, well, it does about the mechanics of it. 2.16 is the one I'm looking for. See where he says he reconciled both of them to God. It actually uses the word both and to God. Here it uses both and to the Father. See, same, same. Now see, having access to the Father is very different than verse 12 that says you were without God. So this is a then and now passage. What was true then? What is true now? What happened between then and now? Who made peace? Who reconciled us? How was it done? All right? This passage is great for preaching the necessity of the church, the, the abolition of the law, uh, the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. It's, it just explains everything. Now, the opposite of verse 19 is verse 12. Verse 12. Um, in verse uh, 19, um, I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, I'm going to go back to the Elmo here to show you the relationship, because it doesn't come across nearly as plainly in the English text. You see this word right here? Anybody want to help me 
pronounce that word in the box, this word right here? Help me. Kenoi. Oh, that's pretty close. It's it's like a Z, a Z or an X. Sinoi. 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 That's a C right there. Sinoi. Or Sinoi. Uh, have you ever heard the word xenophobia? It means fear of strangers. It comes from this word right here. This word means strangers. And in verse 12 it says strangers of the covenants of the promise or from the covenants of promise. But in verse 19, down here, see, he says, you are no longer strangers. So you were strangers in verse 12, but you're no longer strangers in verse 19. Now, back up earlier in verse 12, I told you that um, that... Um, that one word there that was translated commonwealth, this word right here. Some, some, somebody take a crack at this word right here. Like this? Louder, please. Politeus? Yeah, politeus or politeus. And that's kin to what other word did we say? Polis for city? Right. This is the word that means citizenship. See, politeus, citizenship. So you were um, excluded from politeus in Israel. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. But now, over here in verse 19, see, he uses the same word with a, with a sum on the front of it. See, if you take the S-U-M off the front of this word, see what you've got there? Politei. So now you're fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. See, you, you were not citizens in Israel. Now you're fellow citizens. So you used to be strangers. You're not strangers anymore. You didn't used to be citizens. Now you're fellow citizens with the saints. See, you're citizens in the kingdom of Christ. You're fellow citizens with the saints. So clearly verse 12 and verse 19 in the original uh, text are opposites. See, now that you've come into Christ, you're no longer strangers <coughs> and sojourners. You are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, Brother Jess, when are you going to take the Greek? Uh, next quarter. I want you to be all over that stuff like white on rice. You hear me? I will. All right. You'll be dangerous once you get that going. You're already dangerous to yourself and others. I'm talking about being dangerous <laughs> a different way. Okay. It's like the person says, do you feel that you're a danger to yourself and others? Well, yes. <clears throat> All right, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens. Underline strangers and fellow citizens. Connect verse 12. You're fe fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So we are of God's household. We are all one body. We're one new man in Christ. If you hook back through the uh, earlier, earlier verses in the passage. Those are the words I was going to try to show you. <clears throat> All right. These people that are now in Christ, that are of the household of God, have been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, in, in the book of uh, Ephesians, he mentions apostles and prophets uh, two or three times. You've got this passage. You've got uh, Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 5. Write down Ephesians 3, 3 through 5. Alex, how about looking up 3, 3 through 5 and reading it out? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. All right, so the mystery of Christ has been revealed to the apostles and prophets. See, that's why God's people, the church, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Because those apostles and prophets have the revelation of God from the Holy Spirit to explain all these things about Christ. And then if you go over to um, Ephesians 4.11, talking about the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Ephesians 4.11 and 12. Brother Wayne Vogel, read those for us. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. All right. So those are three places, at least in the book of Ephesians, where he mentions the apostles and prophets. The idea here is that because of God's revelation to them, they are the foundation upon which uh, God's people are built with Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. So you have uh, uh, Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the apostles and prophets, their revelation, God's people built upon that foundation. Now, if we were going to go all doctrinal on you, which we're really not right at this point, you could preach a good sermon on Christ, the cornerstone. And you could go, like, right down these passages real quick. You could go like uh, Psalm 118, verse 22, 23. You could go Isaiah 28, 16. You could go Isaiah 8, 14. And you could go 1 Peter 2, 4 through 11, 4 through 12. 4 through 11. You can get a good doctrinal sermon out of that, but it's not really in the text here. It's just assumed here. The, cor the cornerstone was not the nice decorative thing. The cornerstone was this perfectly squared cut stone around which the foundation of the building was built. They would lay this one stone perfectly squared and placed and then the entire rest of the building would be squared, squared and measured in place based on that one stone. That's the stone we're talking about here. <laughs> Isaiah 28:16. Behold, I lay in Zion uh, a stone, a chosen, precious cornerstone. Whoever puts his trust in that stone will not be disappointed. You know, that's that's the stone we're talking about here. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's talking about Isaiah 28.16. That foundation stone, that corner stone, that the whole building is gains its character and its square and everything from that one stone. That's the idea. All right. I'll let you go explore that somewhere else. So it talks about Christ Jesus in whom the whole building being fitted together, see, is growing into a holy temple of the Lord. This, this spiritual building that's built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, squared around, built around Jesus Christ, his redemptive work. It's a temple in the Lord. It's for a dwelling place of God in whom, in Christ. You also are being built together into a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. So God dwells in His temple, the church. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and their revelation of the redemptive work of Christ Jesus. Brother Freddie, how many books of the Bible did Jesus write? None. None. That's exactly right. So, 
From the writings of Jesus, how much of the gospel do we know? Zippo. Jesus did the redemptive work. Jesus came, Jesus taught, Jesus died, Jesus was rose, but Jesus never wrote down for posterity, not a word. How do we have all the teachings of Jesus and the gospel and all the record of his? It's through the apostles and prophets. See? So the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with the incarnation and redemptive work of Christ as the chief cornerstone. John 17, Jesus said, talking about the apostles, he said, Neither do I pray for these only, listen now, but for all those who will believe on me through their word. Through their word. John 17, verse 20. In John 13, 20. He's talking about the apostles. And he says, Whoever receives the one whom I send, namely an apostle, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. So basically that is, God sent Christ, God sent the apostles. So you accept the apostles, you accept Christ. You accept Christ, you accept God. But a bing, but a boom. That's it. Right there. That's it. All right? So, he says, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So how does the Holy Spirit live? He lives in, in his church. Now, Ephesians 2, to me, is, is the greatest doctrinal statement in the Bible. I mean, it just flat out explains... The plan of God in Christ, it explains the gospel so clearly, so plainly, that uh, it, it just explains it all. It's a passage you need to preach, 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 preach. But it's the basics. Anyone want to ask anything about Ephesians 2? Okay, I'm taking that as a no. Um, what could you tell me about um, Satan from Ephesians 2? Raise your hand if you can tell me one thing about him. Prince yep. of the power of the air. Okay, he's the prince over the powers of the air, whatever that means, all right? Uh, Robert, scare me. Maybe he's a spirit. He's a spirit, isn't he? Who else is a spirit? God. God is. Who else is spirits? All rational beings. Yeah. <laughs> How about Hebrews one fourteen? Angels are spirits too, aren't they? So we're all spirits. Spirit means our essential nature is spiritual, not fleshly. So a spirit is an individual being, you know. So Satan is a spirit. What was that word that was translated coarse in, in the translations? What was that original word there? Anybody remember? Eon. Eon. And what does that word mean? Like little G-O-D, or it could be, he could express it other ways too, like what? With the definition we're given in ages, there's also another translation, but... Which makes no sense at all in this context, does it? Yeah, it would be coarse in this context. Well, coarse makes no sense either. What about spiritual forces or spiritual beings, isn't it? Yep, spiritual beings. Um, this, this is, see, there's no text as old as context. If a translation makes no sense in the context, it can't be the right translation. This context is all about spiritual beings. And so he is talking about uh, a spirit being of some kind, or a little G-O-D. 
<clears throat> now let me make this point again. The Bible teaches that there are gods, little g-o-d-s. Now what does it mean by that? It means spirit beings that people worship. The Bible does not say that the gods do not exist. The Bible does say that the gods, plural, are not creator. They are not omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. They do not qualify as God in the sense that our God does. They are spiritual beings. They are powerful, and people do worship them. But they are not the creator. See? That's what the Bible teaches. Modern day secularized Christians teach that the gods, the spiritual beings, don't exist. That's not true. That's not biblical. They do exist. They're just not the creator. They're not God. Okay, they're not the almighty. They're not the most high. They're not the creator of heaven and earth. So, <clears throat> Satan is one of those. Philistines used to worship him and call him ba Baelzebul or Baelzebub. Yeah. Yes. With all these spiritual beings that exist, is it safe to assume that God actually did in fact create these and these are the ones that rebelled against God? I think so, because Colossians 1.16 says, By him were all things created. Things in the heavens and things on earth, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were made by him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things exist. So it's not just safe to assume that, that uh, he created everything. The Bible flat out says he created those spirit beings. And then it says that they sinned against him. 2 Peter 2, 4, they rebelled against him. So, um, the upstairs universe had its rebellion just like the downstairs universe has its rebellion. Somebody else? It's nice to know y'all are alive. Talk to me some more. Yes, sir, way back there in the back. Uh, hey, Dan, uh, talking about the spiritual beings, uh, uh -huh. the Bible talking about how the sons of God took the beautiful women yes. and had a children with them. I mean, yes. is it a, so that, that's the true statement, right? I think, yeah, I think it is. I think that's talking about the fallen angels that came down among uh, men. <clears throat> <coughs> Last time I, I asked the question about uh, uh, how the ancient Chinese uh, got the uh, Chinese characters, uh, which are connected with the Bible. Uh, well, actually, according to the story, so they're the children from uh, angels and uh, human and women. So that actually agreed to what the Genesis talked about. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a subject that I'm sure you've covered in Genesis, and I don't know how you covered it, but you probably um, looked at passages like 2 Peter 2, 4, and Jude 5 and 6, uh, and um, Book of Job, and the intertestamental Jewish literature, which you probably ignored. But which would have helped you a whole lot in that. The book of First Enoch, the book of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Um, the Jewish people uh, believe very strongly in that. And uh, Paul seems to have, because in talking about why women should wear modest clothing in worship, in First Corinthians uh, chapter 11, he says they ought to have the veil on their head because of the angels. Well, what does he mean right there? Well, if you've read the intertestamental literature, it talks about women who um, are causing people to lust after them and how the angels lusted after women that didn't dress modestly. 
And uh, that seems to be exactly what Paul has in mind in 1 Corinthians 11 when he says, you ought to wear your veil because of the angels. Now, is that Sean that's actually going to speak to me back there at the very back? Yeah. <laughs> speak, speak louder, my brother. I was wondering, when could God have created all these spiritual beings? When did he do it? In the very beginning, whenever that was. Now, see, in, in my view, <clears throat> Genesis 1 covers the creation of the physical universe. Genesis 1 does not necessarily cover the creation of the spirit beings that may have been, happened before Genesis 1. See? And, uh, in fact, if you go to Job 38, Job 38... Now, what kind of a discussion are we having right now? Doctrinal. Doctrinal, as opposed to? Exegetical. That's correct, and that's okay for a couple minutes. Now, go to Job 38 and uh, read 4 through 7 there, Brother Sean, nice and loudly and clearly where we hear you over the microphone. Okay. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know, or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. All right, so when God was just laying the foundations of the earth, who was there with him? The sons of God, verse 7. And those sons of God are mentioned in Genesis 6. But they were already there with God when he was creating the heavens and the earth. And if you go back to Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, it says, On the day when the sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord, Satan was among them. So Satan is among those sons of God. The reason they're sons of God, Brother David, is because God created them in the first place before they rebelled against him. There's a Hebrew phrase, Bene Ha Elohim. Bene Ha Elohim. It's only used four times in the Bible or so. Two of them, one or two of them are Genesis 6, and the others are in Job. That's the only time it's ever used. And in all of its occurrences, it has references, I think, to the angels, the fallen angels, some of the other angels before they fell. Now, in English, you can find phrases like that. They're not the same in Hebrew. Back at the very back. Tell me your name again, brother. Travis. Travis, okay. Talk to me. In what other places would the Greek word Iona be translated as the <coughs> Greek little god? Um, in the New Testament... I'm not sure I can find another place. In early Christian literature, bunches of places. Uh, and again, this is, this is a matter of when a translator translates a word, it doesn't matter what word it is, there is one thing over all other things that determines the meaning of a word. Guess what that is? Context. Context. That's exactly right. And... How does a dictionary get the possible meanings of a word? Well, what it does is it looks through ancient literature and it finds that word and it looks at the context and it sees what that particular writer means by that word. And that's where it gets the possible meanings of the word. See? So, uh, <clears throat> anywho, very good questions. I like it when you ask questions. See you after chapter.